I mean, I looked at where we saw them before the season I, because I have all the rankings that we did uh, each spot and I had them at six, sixth and Donatas and Ritis had the Pantanecos outside the top eight, nine and tenth. And, you know, to be fair, I don't blame, you know, us for these uh, power rankings because let's not forget, nobody knew they will sign Kendrick Nunn. Uh, you know, after four rounds or five rounds, whatever that was, and he is a game changer. He solves so many problems for an already excellent defensive team. And so, you know, I think it's actually crazy how they exceeded our expectations, but not only our expectations, but I think their own expectations to be at the number two spot. Uh, we are not sure yet if they, they're, they're going to keep it, but to do that with a completely new team where you signed all the players in, in your first year, it, it, it's actually pretty insane. And, uh, Lately, just two things, my, my two cents from this last game against Barcelona is that I look at Costas Lucas and the way he's playing, and I think he's finally confident in his role where he is right now in Panathinaikos because in the first part of the season, he was kind of, uh, I don't know, overdoing it a little bit, trying to maybe prove somebody a point or wh whatever that was. You know, he had to adjust to a new teammate's new role. He was scoring like around nine points in the EuroLeague and while doing like four assists, but also doing it at a low percentage and also at four turnovers per game. And right now he's doing, you know, those isolation plays in the end, he's creating for others. And in the last six EuroLeague games, he's scoring almost 14 points per game on 56% shooting from two, 48% shooting from three. But the most important part for me is that he's averaging almost seven assists while doing only two turnovers. This is huge for Panathinaikos because we are not—we all know their defense is great, but for their offense to have Slukas playing like this right before the playoffs, I think is amazing. And um, the only downside from this game is that they couldn't manage to keep the tiebreaker over Barcelona. They had lost the first game by eight points and they were plus 13 with one minute to go mm -hmm. and plus uh, 11 with 3.3 seconds remaining. And they... You know, they fouled, obviously, so Barcelona could score only two points. But they messed up the defensive rebounding part and, and they missed on purpose. They got the rebound and, you know, Pantanecos fouled again. And now uh, they are tied. And in case of a tiebreaker, I don't know how that's going to be decided. But uh, they don't have it like a direct tiebreaker over Barcelona. So, mm -hmm. you know, great game. Another huge win, like... To, to see Olympiacos lose and to win for Pantanacos to win both games was, was, was amazing. And, you know, we only have three games left and I think they're a uh, front runner for a home court advantage. And like uh, we were talking about after the Greek derby, we thought that that was yeah. a crucial loss, right? But after bouncing back with these two wins, and especially this win, I think it's even more important psychologically for the team, sort of builds the character, you know, that you can be down 15 in the second and then come back. And a lot of it has to be props to Ergen Atama. I mean, mm. he, he took the... I mean, there was probably the wrong call of... Uh, uh, backcourt violation and then uh, he got the technical foul but that really woke up the arena woke up the team and I feel like I don't know what's his key of success because we always talk about Ergen Ataman I know one okay money oh. everywhere he goes <laughs> he brings money yeah. he managed to convince sponsors to join his team he managed the team uh, to convince team owners you know to somehow to find those uh, sponsors because you can watch his track record all these teams that he joined you know they suddenly became rich and of course i'm not saying that they started you know uh, from the jump being the top one team by budget even these players that they have, of course, there were some uh, huge deals, but it's not like uh, they brought like 10 guys uh, who get paid uh, 2 million and over. But let's say now, for, first of all, it's money. Second of all, he's a great general manager, uh, finding right pieces mm -hmm. to make a winning team because nobody uh, could say that Jerry and Grant is going to be so important for for. for his team. Matthias Lazard is kind of obvious, you know, Kendrick Nunn came here for a mission, Costas Lucas, uh, yes. But some other guys like Marius Grigonis, uh, you know, well-deserved uh, spots on, on the core of Panathinaikos. He earned this spot as himself, but at the same time, Ataman likes guys like Grigonis. So, you know, to me, it's like money, 
general manager instinct uh, and then relying on on players you know mm -hmm. giving them all, all the yeah <laughs> spotlights and uh to put everything on their shoulders to decide but that's how he picks players those who can you know play one-on-one -on -one, who can take the responsibility and who can create shots for themselves and for others hey uh -huh. you, you can't blame that ataman has money i know a lot of Euroleague teams that have money yeah, exactly but exactly they're fighting for a plane right now for mm -hmm. their lives He's in the second spot feeling good about himself. And so. how much more money do they have than last year, Panathinaikos? A lot. A lot more? <laughs> <laughs> I lot. mean, you can, you can compare rosters. And uh, yeah, no, I know, I know. It's kind of obvious. I mean, but, but yeah, Augustus had a, a good point. And to me, what's the most interesting part is that it's just the year one. And mm -hmm. we see some pieces uh, that probably will be moved in offseason. There are a lot of rumors about Luca Vildaza, Juancho Hernan Gomez, Balcerovsky, uh, guys like that. So you can imagine, first of all, he's uh, finding his core already. Okay, we don't know if Kendrick Nunn is going to stay in power or not, if he's getting an opportunity to, could, to get back to the NBA. But if he's staying, he found his core, he will get into the free agency again to add one, two pieces crucial yeah. for his core. And then this Panthakos team can be even better. So that's that's the scariest part about Panthakos to me. I agree very for much the future. with you. And even looking at this season, what's left what's left of it, we have three games left. And uh, for them, they have a, Ver a Virtus who are on a clear downfall. I mean, mm. uh, we're seeing them going down in the positions in the standings. So that game is very winnable. And then they have the two German teams left, one one home, one away. But I could say both probably home. <laughs> in in, in, Mu in uh, Munich, we could expect uh, the Greens to take over that gym. So uh, I, I, I see... Both are uh, definitely Alba is a uh, you, you assume they're gonna win and against Munich I, fe I feel like uh, also a winnable game so I could see them winning uh, all three finishing second and then maybe we won't see Olympiakos and Panathinaikos like we were sort of hinting at before Hoping. <laughs> because they would be second and yeah. Olympiakos won't go as low as as uh, seven. If they don't lose, then they're in a good position because they have the tiebreaker against Monaco. They have two and zero against them, and they are tied with, uh, like I said, with Barcelona. So, if they don't lose, uh, and since Monaco have a really easy schedule as well, mm -hmm. they're still in a pretty good shape to take the take the second spot.